Lynn, the host. So Kathy is co-host and Lynn. Okay. Okay. So um, I want to call the finance committee meeting of January 26, 2021 to order. And uh, we have uh, an agenda with several significant items for discussion. And uh, I will, uh, but I first want to uh, check with everybody because this is a meeting that pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30, section 18, is uh, a meeting that is being held um, via remote participation. And therefore, I need to go through each committee member and make sure that you can hear me by responding and and uh, then as you respond, we will know that we can hear you. So uh, I will start with uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Uh, Jane Scheffler. Present. Kathy Shane. Present here. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. And Dorothy Pam. Present. Um, in addition, we have several staff members present uh, who are um, involved with um, the presentations today and discussion that we're going to have at the meeting. Uh, but first, I would like to um, welcome Jane. This is the first meeting that she's attended. Um, attending since she was uh, just appointed as a resident member. Um, and um, so, Jane, uh, welcome. And uh, you've briefly met the rest of the committee. And um, I don't know if uh, anybody has any other comments that they'd like to make. Otherwise, we'll just launch into the agenda. So, uh, the First presentation, the first thing I want to get to is in the first item after called order on the agenda list is the um, stormwater management bylaw and illicit discharge bylaws uh, presentation and discussion. And uh, we have several people who are present um, at today's meeting to assist us in this presentation to explain the bylaw and to answer questions about it. Um, I think that we want to get a general understanding of what this requirement is all about, uh, but um, we want to very quickly um, focus in on our aspect of it. It was referred to two committees, the Town Services uh, Committee and, the, uh, and our committee, and our role is to look at the financial implications. So um, the two people who are here um, involved with the presentation uh, from the, uh, are Beth Wilson, who's been working on uh, developing our planning and working. And I think that some of you who have had a chance to look at material that was sent have seen her memorandum, which is quite extensive regarding this and Guilford Mooring, the superintendent of the Department of Public Works, who um, is responsible for all DPW operations and therefore has been uh, uh, the one who uh, bears uh, ultimate responsibility, which he always likes to have. And uh, I just want to note that I know something was said at the uh, council meeting by uh, Alyssa Brewer, um, as members of the select board, Alyssa and I had been um, aware of this for some time um, because we knew it was coming. We just didn't know when it was coming. And I have to frankly admit until I got Beth's um, rather lengthy memorandum, I didn't know the details of what we were expecting, but um, this has been something that's been in a while for a while, in, in path for a while. So. I'm going to um, introduce Beth and ask her to just give us um, an overview of what the process is like and what the bylaws 
that we're looking at and we and help us to zero in on the financial implications. So Beth, hi. Beth, hi. Put the slide presentation up. Yes, I will do that. Um, How's that look? Yeah, you can see it, can't you, on my screen? Yes. I put it up on mine, on Beth. I put it up for you. You just need to tell me when to Oh, you did. Oh, OK. Then I can the not screen. share my screen, I guess. I guess that's OK. So that's your screen we're looking at. Yes. Not, not my screen. OK, perfect. Um, OK, well. Uh, Again, I'd like to thank everybody for um, listening to the presentation today on the stormwater management and IDDE bylaws. Um, as Andy was saying, this, a similar presentation was given to town council and to the TSO. And I will go through the basics again, but skim, skim a bit of the presentation because I, I know a number of you have heard it and you wanna focus on the financial aspects of it. So, okay, next slide. There we go. Um, so Amherst has a stormwater drainage system. It consists of our, uh, oh. oh, this is the old presentation. Oh. Oops. No, stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> that one doesn't have the financial parts to it. So I think we need to, we need this one. Okay, why don't you put yours up and it is now of it. Yeah, it's open for you to share. Your screen is paused. Try that again. Can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Yes. Yes or no? Yes. 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 Okay, great. <laughs> All right. Okay, Amherst Stormwater Drainage System. Um, it consists of our catch basins, drainage swales, uh, piping and manholes that carry stormwater from impervious areas, parking lots and roads to outfalls, um, which is usually at our streams and rivers and ponds, um, it's maintained by Amherst CPW, and it's also known as our municipal separate storm sewer system by the EPA and DEP. That's the acronym they've given to storm water drainage systems. Um, in 2018, Amherst applied for coverage under the 2016 Massachusetts General MS4 permit, which is administered by EPA and DEP it's the Massachusetts permit that all municipalities have to apply for to basically be given the right to discharge. Um, and as I said, we applied in 2018 and we were granted coverage in 2019. The primary requirement of the um, MS4 permit is for municipalities to develop stormwater management programs. So stormwater management program, the primary goal for all municipalities is to have their discharge from their stormwater system or their MS4 at all the outfalls meet water quality standards. Um, and to do that, DEP has required all stormwater management programs to have six minimum control measures, um, public education and outreach, public involvement and par participation, illicit discharge detection and elimination, construction site stormwater runoff control, stormwater management in new and redevelopment projects, and good housekeeping and pollution prevention from town-owned properties, basically. So of those three minimum control measures, which were 
we've, you know, we've started our program, we're starting working on the control measures. Three of them require a bylaw be established, and that's sort of a preliminary part of the program, one of the first things you need to do. So we've developed two bylaws. One is called the IDDE, or Illicit Discharge Detection and Elimination Bylaw. The other we've called our Stormwater Management Bylaw, and it covers all the requirements for the, those other, the other two minimum control measures, construction site stormwater runoff control and stormwater management in new and redevelopment projects. And those two bylaws, which you have copies of and what have gone to the town council and the TSO need to be finalized and approved and enacted by the end of June this year, 2021. So the illicit discharge and detection elimination bylaw really focuses on um, establishing that it's illegal to dump anything into our MS4. So that would be into a catch basin, um, also to have any kind of illicit connection to our system. If you're connected somehow pipe-wise and you're, you're um, causing contamination or producing some that's going into our system. Um, that's really an illicit connection. Also, it's illegal to obstruct our, the flow of our MS4 system. The bylaw also establishes the authority um, for the town, TPW, to go onto private property to inspect for illicit connections or illegal dumping. Gives the town the authority then, if they find an issue, to either suspend or actually disconnect somebody from our, our drainage system. Um, it also requires anyone who has any kind of a connection to our system or, or even just a catch basin to protect that, that access to our system. That's what is meant by BMP, best management practices. Um, people are required to protect those so that they're not contaminating our system. And they're also required to notify DPW or the town of any spills. The DPW, uh, the bylaw establishes that the town has the authority to enforce all of those things with fines. Um, and the stormwater management bylaw um, that establishes stormwater management permits that are going to be required for any new development, redevelopment projects land disturbance, any land disturbance or any kind of a disturbance that um, disturbs drainage characteristics on a parcel that's an acre or more. Um, so that this, the bylaw really sets the stage for us to start issuing those permits. There are some exemptions or certain, certain projects, certain properties that are exempt and wouldn't need a permit. The bylaw has a appeal and, and waivers sections to it so people can appeal having to get a permit. Um, and then the bylaw establishes that the town can create stormwater regulations. And the regulations are going to get more into the specifics on the permitting process, what people need to submit to the town if, if they're required to get a stormwater permit, um, what standards their stormwater design is going to have to meet. So they would submit their design and then uh, DPW engineering would be reviewing it and sort of what are the standards that their design needs to meet to be approved. And it would, and the regulations are gonna also establish the, the permitting fees. So the fee that would be submitted along with the permit application. Um, yeah, that's basically, oh, and, and then again, the, by, the stormwater bylaw includes enforcement with fines for people who either do work without a permit or don't abide by the uh, requirements of the permit that they're issued. So the financial aspects to the bylaws, which is what you're, you're interested in. <laughs> um, like I mentioned, there are permit fees that will be part of uh, this whole stormwater program and, and is will be part of the Stormwater management bylaws regulations really um, will include a fee structure for getting a permit. 
Um, and looking at other communities, we have looked a bit at what um, other communities are using and the fee schedules vary quite a bit. The range for these permit fees is from about $50 to 2000, depending on the project size, depending on the municipality. Um, that is one financial aspect of the bylaws. Another is the fines that I mentioned. And in both the bylaws that's set at, at a maximum of $300 a day, it kind of builds up to the first you get a warning and then you get a, a smaller fee, but that structure is also um, very similar to other Amherst bylaws with the same amounts of money. Um, and then the, 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 bigger, the bigger aspect is, is the whole permitting, the whole program that we're required to do under the permit. What's, what is the cost of that program going to be over the next however many years? Um, and so the, the bylaw, the stormwater bylaw, gives the town the authority to create a stormwater utility or enterprise fund. Um, it's not required by the permit, but it's something that a number of towns across Massachusetts have done. And they, they do it because of the, the overall cost of the program, because obviously the permit fees aren't going to cover very much of, um, of the program. So what we've put together is some costing for FY 22, 23, and 24. And these are estimates. Um, I've divided it up by the, um, by the different tasks that we had. So public education and outreach, public involvement and participation, the IDDE program, um, construction site runoff control, and stormwater for new and redevelopment projects, and then general housekeeping. Um, so divided up that way, the numbers are very much based on what's seen in other communities. There's been studies done um, by, especially by college students <laughs> in different colleges across Massachusetts on the impact of the MS4 program on municipalities cost-wise. Um, so some things to note, I guess, would be public education and outreach and public involvement and participation, we've already started. And those, those two tasks needs to just continue forever. <laughs> and as much as we'll change things, do special projects, they're sort of consistent costs that we'll ha have um, every year. And so you see those costs aren't changing in the next three fiscal years. Um, the IDDE program, in FY22, there's a number of um, program development documents, I guess you can call them, that need to be finished in FY22, such as the written IDDE program, which is a, it's, it's a document. Um, so that's a, that's a one-time cost, similar to the, these O&M plans that we need to put together and a written plan to maintain. So these are all sort of written plans that are required by the permit. They're listed as, as requirements in the permit and they're all need to be finished in FY22, but then the costing doesn't continue. Um, but then you'll see some other costs start happening in FY24 and those have to do uh, mostly with inspecting and sampling all the outfalls. So we need to be, by this point, we need to have a real good idea of where our outfalls are, are, what kind of shape they're in, and which ones we need to go in and, and sam start sampling. So some of those costs show up there. Um, FY24, we have to actually install a best man management practice for nitrogen reduction. Um, so that is referring to something like a storm scepter, some kind of an improvement to our infrastructure that will help in removing nutrients. Um, so that's under FY24, we put in some, again, some estimates for that. 
This is where the permitting, the next under construction site, stormwater runoff control. Um, this is the permitting that we're talking about. And again, in FY22, this will be still sort of establishing that permitting process, putting a lot of effort in by the town engineer and our civil engineer to continue to figure out what they, what documents they would like to review, how that whole process is gonna go, developing forms for the permitting. And then as time goes on, FY23, I feel like is gonna be the first year where we're actually doing the permitting. <clears throat> so for every new development project that comes in, for example, forms will be filled out, applicants will be submitting and our engineers will be reviewing the applications and issuing permits with conditions and things. So then that's a cost that would really continue into the future. Um, good housekeeping. Um, there's a bit more to this that happens even later on, but um, catch basin cleaning, street sweeping is something we're already, we're already doing, been doing forever. Um, so for FY22, those costs are, are in budget for FY22. We do need to um, optimize the process under MS4. There's requirements under MS4 that are going to make this make both of these processes improve a bit. And so we've included some costing as we go down the road of, of implementing those improvements. And then there's an annual report, an MS4 annual report that gets submitted every year. So that is another cost that will continue on. So that's what we have for costing right now. Um, and that's the end of the presentation too. So I guess we're open for questions now. Um, could you send um, this presentation or have Guilford send it to me so that we can send it to the full committee? Yes, definitely. I, we, we were still working on it today. So that's why I didn't get it, get it into your packets or get it anywhere. We were finishing some stuff up, but yes, definitely. Uh, Andy, do you want me to take the screen down or to have Beth take the oh. screen down? Um, well, if there are questions that are going to come up about the uh, budget part of it, then maybe it's worth having the screen up for a few minutes to see mm -hmm. what the questions are. Um, I know you're, the, this uh, presentation, you did a, um, you really, I appreciate you laying out the costs for us. Um, what are the revenues that are typical in a typical community from the permitting fees and the fines and how do they match against the uh, expenditures? Um, I can take a stab at that. Like in the previous slide, the permitting fees that we're seeing in other towns are, are you know, relatively small. Um, and I, I, I can't imagine that some of these towns with a, a fee of, of say it's five hundred dollars get a, get that many projects that come through to be permitted that it that it covers um, these kind of costs these program costs um, you know the permitting fees I always think of permitting fees as really paying for the administration of the permit itself. Um, so, and then the, then the finding would just be under an enforcement situation. So that too, I think is, is pretty limited. Is that what you think, Guilford? Yes, the, most of these, most of the program won't create very much money to make the, meet the needs of the federal permit. Um, at some point there's gotta be a decision made on how to fund the work that needs to go on. Should it be part of the tax base or should it be a separate stormwater utility or enterprise type system? Uh, Dorothy. It's an enterprise system that I'm gonna start recognizing other people. But if you're going to have a, uh, have an enterprise fund, what are the revenues that come into the enterprise fund? So communities that have a, a stormwater utility actually will base the revenues that come into the enterprise system on the 
amount of impervious area that a parcel contributes to the stormwater system. If you have a, a lot that's one acre and it's all paved, you would pay to have that paved lot. It would be maybe twice as much as someone who has an acre lot with half of it paved. Um, that's one of the ways of doing it. Uh, other communities just set a standard rate. If you're a single family home, you pay this amount of money. If you're a multifamily, you pay these, these rates. Um, so going into a stormwater utility, you have different options for how you would charge rates and different ways to set up some type of system to, to make, to collect revenue. Okay, that explains a little bit. So I'm going to start uh, recognizing uh, members of the committee who have questions. Uh, and I see four, uh, at least four hands, including Kathy, who has her hand up physically. Yeah, yeah, I, because I was made co-host, I'm like, Lynn, I can't um, raise my little computer hand. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So let me let me start with Dorothy and Bob because they came in early with questions and then I will get back to you. Um, so Dorothy. Um, so this is a new program, a requirement by the EPA. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and as I looked at the budgets, um, either all of it is for planning, writing, and coordinating. Uh, it was possible that it, construction site Southwest runoff control, that was 6,000 and 10,000 and 10,000. Maybe that was actually a, a physical something or is this all non-physical? Um, so are you building anything? Is there any infrastructure here? Oh, um, no, the only thing listed here that's really more infrastructure might be the, there's a, it says plan and install a BMP nitrogen reduction. Right. So that's yeah. under, Right, and that's FY24, that's our first requirement to, to go in and actually install something. Okay, so then, um, and that's the year that uh, the, the expenses are the highest at 59,000. Uh, mm -hmm. Going on, once you've paid all this money out in work and making plans and uh, it putting that, um, what would the yearly cost of maintaining this uh, system be? Yeah, uh, we didn't, we haven't gone out that far yet. Um, things that, just as just an idea of, of that is sort of down here where we've got catch basin cleaning and as we, as we move along, we need to optimize that according to MS4. So there's, there's costing for that. And then there's things like the, these O&M plans and other plans that you that we're putting together that then we have to uh, we have to do inspections and things like that mm -hmm. going into the future to to, sh to show that we you know it's not listed here but we have to do stormwater pollution prevention plans for our more industrial type facilities like the transfer station we've actually mm -hmm. already paid for that and done that but that SWIP then includes inspecting and monitoring into the future. So there are some long-term mm -hmm. parts to the program that more involve um, monitoring what we're doing, inventorying things mm -hmm. like inventorying the amount of uh, street sweepings we collect every year and inventorying um, the amount, the volume of catch basin cleaning. And so there is, yeah, anyway, but I can't give you a number for that right now. <laughs> All right. So, so it, that, in other words, we're going to the, the goal of, of having turning no water into the system that's not meeting clean standards is a very high goal. So in order to meet this goal, the system is set up, but this is going to be a new, new expense ongoing of, of some measure, which is why I guess you are considering a new system of fees for an enterprise, for an enterprise system. Is, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out where it's going. Right. So it's going to be, it's going to be an expansion of what we do already. Many of the stormwater things we do now are basically physical repairs to the system. A, right. a base, a basin fails, we fix the basin. A pipe fails, we fix the pipe. Uh, we need to upsize the pipe or upsize the culvert, we fix that, and that's paid for in capital and general fund money right now and some grant money. 
So yes, as we go through the program of the planning part where we identify our problems, we'll be going through and trying to address how to correct those problems. And those will be above and beyond the cost we now have for just maintaining a pipe system that collects the water and sends it on its way. Okay, thank you. So Bob Hegner. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, I've got, a, I have a few questions. I guess I would just more a statement that following up to what Dorothy said is that, you know, when I look at the permit, there are some activities down the line that might happen, like inspection, you know, doing forensics to find out who did what, enforcement, um, there's record keeping. So I think there's maybe some other expenses that will occur in the future that aren't covered under this list. So again, I realize you're still working your way through it, but I think they will need to be we need to make sure we cover all of what's in the the permit that I that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the other another question I have is Beth, you mentioned sampling, and I guess the question is, what are we sampling for? I mean, the NIPTI's uh, program, to my knowledge, covers all the priority pollutants, which is like 120 something, uh, which I know we don't sample for now. Uh, so oh. what is it we're sampling for and how much sampling do we have to do? Because I think your sampling kits, you've got like $5,000. It just doesn't seem like that's a realistic number if we have to sample 120 something uh, pollutants. Right, yeah, no, you, you focus on sort of what are the common stormwater pollutants. So sediment, so TSS, total suspended. <coughs> That's the, so sediment and nutrients um, and hydrocarbons. Um, those are the primary things that you're looking at and color um, and actually even just well, turbidity kind of falls with TSS too. It, it's not a whole lot of pollutants. It's really sort of some of the more basic stuff. Um, so some of the simple sampling test kits that are out there for things like nutrients, like for nitrogen and phosphorus, you can use. And then also you really do focus on the priority outfalls. Um, so part of, before we actually get out to the sampling, we need to inspect all of our outfalls, prioritize them based on, based on flow and um, based on just sort of an initial look at them. And then we end up, we don't end up sampling all of them because yeah, we have hundreds of outfalls. Yeah. Um, so, and also, you know, this, this first year that FY24, we may use the 5,000 and, and realize, oh, that didn't quite get us as far as we need to. And then the next year, do some more. But. I, I understood. I, I just wanted to point out that, you know, I, I just, it, it, just reading through the permit, it seems like there's a lot more um, sort of monitoring and sampling and forensics, if you will than what we might be doing now. And so we should be making sure we're aware of what the cost implications of those are. Um, the, the other thing, I, the other question I had, and this goes back to the discussions we had uh, for the FY21 budget, um, where uh, Guilford, I think you mentioned that we might need to re upgrade or replace some elements of MS4. And do you have any updates on that? I know at the time you said you didn't know what specifically might be required. No, there's, there's no update on that. The, as we move through the program, all the monitoring and the reporting we have to do will actually flesh out what we have to work on first. So we still basically have about three to four more years of the program before we actually have to, to do some substantial planning and substantial in, in improvements based on what we find over those three years. Okay, well, thanks. Um, Sean Mangano is our finance director. Do you have anything that you wanted to say? So I just say your hand was up. Yeah, I don't know if you want to go to Kathy first. And after Kathy, I don't know if she wants to Okay, because we have two other members of the committee. Uh, Bernie also had some questions, so I'll come back to you. Kathy? 
Um, I'm just going to build, I think, on the questions. If I focus on FY24, where there's a first year getting things up and running in terms of what revenues might cover, am I understanding it right that the line that says $10,000, that's construction site, runoff control, stormwater management, new development, that would be, we could set a, a permit fee, I guess, if we wanted to, with the expectation that it would cover that. That's that's a new site construction fee. Is that, you know, so there would be a revenue yeah. match to that. Um, and then, so, and then the Guilford, when you said if we did a utility, you could do it on a per residence or per um, impervious lot size. So impervious lot size, would that be, you'd have to go out, um, I'll just, I'm looking out my window at the snow, which also means I'm looking out at our, at our totally pervious <laughs> driveway, which is dirt. Um, because long ago, you know, we've never had it paved. So would there be some properties that had no impervious that you'd have to say this one just doesn't have any. So is that an expensive, uh, if you went that route for the utility side of it, is that a more expensive thing to implement and it also might be changing over time because you know, someone paves their driveway versus a uh, totally pervious driveway. So it was a, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm examining it for in out years, if you did a utility, where would the revenues be and what would they be associated with it? Um, so that was my question. So yes, on, on the first part of your question, the $10,000 and that and the construction site control and so forth, that's something that the permit fees would, should, we should try to make the permit fees match what we're spending there. As you talk about the utility, um, yes, you can set your budget as being, you need to do $4 million worth of work and then you can balance out that $4 million of work based on who's got the most pervious or impervious piece of property. Um, and that could change every year. Um, there's communities that do it and um, people are changing and people will take out impervious area just to make their rates go down lower. So yes, rates could change and fluctuate year to year, depending if you did it that way. Can I just ask, you came up with the last, num the bottom line number I'm looking at right now is 59,000. Um, and as Bob said, there might be, there's different, and then you said 4 million. What's, is there something I'm missing between 59,000 and 4 million? 4 million is a nice round number. Well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, so is 100,000. And if I'm looking at 59,000, is that, um, you know, I'm just, is there something I'm missing about a big cost that's not on this sheet? Andy, can I weigh in on that? Because that's uh, part of what I was going to speak to. So, um, so we have been putting some money towards stormwater already, as Guilford mentioned earlier. It's been part of our capital plan for a few years, right, Guilford? Um, and I think you said that money has been mostly used for like the repairs that come up. Well, the, the, what the money that's in the capital plan is being used specifically to support our getting the the stormwater. Uh, permit program going and get, getting things done for that. So is that a cost that we would envision um, would transfer over if they if a utility was going to get set up would that cost transfer over to the utility? If you if you use the utility, yes, that should transfer over to the utility. Okay. Um, and that's a cost that eventually would go away once we have the program set up and could be reallocated towards um, the program itself. Yes. So I, my point was just, I wanted to point out for some people that we have been putting, I think it ranges between 50 to 100,000 a year towards the stormwater program. We've been doing it through capital, but it's really to help facilitate getting this set up. Um, you know, I like the idea of a utility in some respects because it really separates the cost of the stormwater program and allows us to be more proactive and manage it in the future as opposed to, you know, reactive. Um, so I, I see that, uh, that positive to it. Um, I think we do need to maybe Guilford and I and, and Beth can dig in more to like what would be the annual operating cost once the program is fully implemented. I think Beth mm -hmm. said this is more of a how we're getting in over the next few years, but it's going to be quite some time before the program is fully um, 
operational and, and come back with what that would look like. And can I just follow up, Sean, on the, you know, in Guilford, yes, 4 million is a nice round number, but it's a lot bigger than 100,000. And I'm just remembering when we didn't know Centennial was coming and we didn't know the size of it, is there a $4 million something that's coming to us because of this program or a million um, that, that's in and out year uh, that's at that level? Um, if you look at other communities and what they're doing, they're in the million dollar ranges for what they're doing for uh, stormwater. So any anywhere in the million dollar range is a, is a good number. The We run, I mean, the water and sewer enterprise systems, which maintains piping systems and does monitoring and sampling and so forth, they they run in the three, three to $4 million range every year. So that was just a, another reason to pick the $4 million range. That's kind of well, mirrors the others. I mean, I guess I'll just keep pushing. I don't understand why, because we've got a water and sewer, so we've got that system. I would just, if you can't answer it now, it's what would increase, and I think you're talking about annual costs, if you're, what would increase it to that level um, in a town the size of Amherst? So I, I just would like, you know, I think if if we've got that coming, we, we need to know about it and, and what are the elements? Because we're not looking at, even Sean, with your 50 to 100,000 a year, we're, we're not anywhere near that number, um, so. Yeah, and like I said, we'll, we'll dig into it more and look out a little bit. I think to Guilford's point, we don't know exactly what is gonna, so there's gonna be sort of the, the annual operating cost to this program but then there could also be capital repairs just like there are with this, with um, the water and sewer fund. I think some of those large capital repairs are the ones that we, we won't fully know until the testing is done. Um, so, but we can come back with more information on that. Yeah, a couple of things that I thought about and then I'm gonna call them Bernie. Um, one is that uh, we're not the first community as we know from best presentations tonight and in January, but uh, or in December, but uh, the uh, there are other communities that have had the system for a while. And so we should be able to obtain information from those communities about what expenses they have been incurring and what revenue they have been receiving, how they've been receiving it. If they have utilities or enterprise funds set up, then they have budgets that go along with them. And to the extent that we're able to make inquiry, I think our understanding will be better. Uh, the other thing that I was um, curious about is that uh, before the meeting actually started, Beth and I had a brief conversation. And of course, we're just recognizing that we have a stormwater system already. It's just not regulated. And, uh, but there's a lot of physical infrastructure in place and I assume that that system is really what we're building this all on. Um, and we've been maintaining that system. So the cost of maintaining that system that is currently in place, is that being transferred over to this new enterprise? Or is this enterprise being layered on top of what already exists? What I envision would be that the, the, trans, the money we're spending now on stormwater would be transferred to the utility. So you would see some savings on the general side as you bring up the utility, and then the utility would, would carry the full load of maintaining the system. Bernie? Yeah, um, you know, thinking along the same lines as you, Andy, I, I, our friends in Northampton, I believe, have gone through this whole stormwater management trial already to their <laughs> to their discontent in some ways. So I'm, I'm thinking we could learn from uh, what they've done, certainly. Um, I would, in learn, looking at what happened in Northampton, and, and I would favor uh, development of utility um, that keeps these expenses isolated and um, uh, in, in, in more transparent, I think, than what they might be if they just got folded into our current, uh, um, one of our current operating budgets. Um, Gilfred, have you, you, you have a notion about how many um, permits you're gonna have to issue and, and the nature of the inspections they're gonna have to go on? So 
we were going to probably, we probably do about, well, it's probably in the realm of about 20 or 30 permits is what we do a, a year currently for, um, for site plan review and subdivisions and so forth. Um, so we'll probably have about the same number of permits that we'll have to look at. Um, we do now have to look at additional information, which is the stormwater side. So that's the additional part to the permit that we already look at for other things. Um, so it's probably about 30 or 40, probably. Okay. And the nature of the inspections that'll have to take place to begin to ferret out some of those illicit connections? Well, for the illicit connections, that's a, a whole separate program, which we'll have to somehow set up and do a lot of um, investigating. Many of, most of that will actually revolve around the, the sampling of the outfalls. If we have the detections that the outfall, the things we're not supposed to have, then that outfall and you know, all the piping up that outfall will be where we start searching to look for the connections. Okay, so that mm -hmm. cost hasn't really been determined yet. No. Do you know of any illicit connections that already exist? We, we find them every once in a while. Um, they're, they're, they're people who have connected their sanitary sewer to the stormwater system. There's um, some people who have connected their sump pumps and other internal pumps to the stormwater system, which actually they'll have to be disconnected because of this program. Um, some can remain, some will have to be disconnected. Um, yeah, we, we, we know people have hooked things together and are not supposed to hook together. Yeah, and some of them are, are, are probably more obvious than others. I mean, if you've got um, roof drains or other stuff like that. Um, the, the, the last kind of, um, uh, again, learning from Northampton, I think Northampton tried to uh, come up with some kind of regular fee or tax for, uh, for stormwater and that was not well received. So we need, we're gonna need to look at how we we build the funding on this. Um, the other just observation is with nitrogen reduction and, and lids, I mean, a lot of that stuff could be uh, worked on with the Conservation Commission, with the Planning Board, and um, really uh, encourage people to, um, to, to, to make changes so that they don't have to incur additional fees and we don't have to incur additional costs by chasing them and, and finding them. So. Thanks. Uh, I just want uh, this, the budget, looking at these budgets, um, I don't, uh, um, I, I don't have sticker shock. Uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking this would be much more expensive than, uh, than what, what's outlined here. Um, so my concern would be that we, we, you know, we, we collect all the, the, uh, all the potential costs that might over time that might be, uh, might fall into this project. Mm -hmm. So Bernie, when you're talking about uh, costs, uh, I, are you meaning additional costs to what we're already incurring to maintain the system that's presently in place? Well, to, um, I, I think we probably have a good idea where we're gonna have to make, I, I would imagine that Guilford and his engineer and his, his, his staff have a good idea of, of where in our existing stormwater system is gonna have to be improvements. And as, as Sean pointed out from my old my time in the old finance committee. Uh, yeah, we have been putting money aside for this. My concern would be that as we begin to get into enforcement of this, especially with the, uh, the illicit connections piece that we, um, we're, we're careful to, to, to budget as to how much time and effort it's gonna have to go into that to make it work. And uh, uh, once, I mean, once they begin sampling and get an idea of, um, further idea of how bad things are or how good things are, um, that'll drive the, uh, the inspection program as well. Um, yeah, Lynn? Yeah, um, I don't have sticker shop, shock. I'm just, um, I, I'm concerned about setting up an enterprise fund in which we all know from the beginning there isn't going to be sufficient revenue to support the fund. All of the rest of our enterprise funds, or at least to my knowledge, um, don't operate that way. And so one question I have is, is there, an, are there any other mechanisms? I have no problem with trying to isolate the costs. 
I just think we need to realize we're isolating costs only so we know how much we have to budget annually to keep the enterprise fund afloat. Sean? Yeah, so we would only go the enterprise fund route if we had a, a fee set up as a revenue source. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't start moving expenses into the enterprise fund if we didn't have that, that fee set up as well. Um, and we can come back, one of the other things we can come back with are some of the different fee structures um, that other communities have looked at. Like Guilford mentioned, there's some that are per square foot, there's ranges, um, there's flat fees. We can, we can come back with a few different alternatives that other communities have looked at. Um, but we wouldn't move costs to an enterprise fund until we had a revenue source. The other thing I, I just, this really looking out and, and hypothesizing that as the present town council or future town councils look at changes in zoning that could lead to increased development density, is our present system set up to handle that to begin with? And how is that going to, how will greater density in zoning impact this program as well as the present system that this is linking into? So, so the system, the system currently, the system is currently what, what it is and it does have some issues in certain areas. Um, the one thing that the state has been doing probably since the late 80s, early 90s, is requiring that developers um, post-development stormwater has to equal pre-development stormwater. So that has been in a place for a long time. So controlling your stormwater when you develop something is something that is not new to people who are developing. So as you talk about developing downtown and you're going to take, you're going to take a property that's 50% covered by uh, a building and now you're going to make it 100% covered by impervious surface, that developer still under other state rules has to keep his stormwater discharges the same as it was before he developed. And he'll have to come up or they will have to come up with methodologies for doing that. Um, you build a, a five-story building in the center of town, you may have to put a green roof on top to capture your water, your rainwater, and use it as a to water the plants and have a evaporation type system up there to let the water go back up and not come into the system. You may have to build some type of cistern inside this, the building to hold rainwater and use that for some other purpose. Uh, it could be used for toilet flushing. It could be used for watering your plantings around the building as well. Um, so the requirement of not increasing your stormwater footprint has been in place in the state and in the country for quite a while. So that's not a change. The change is, is how do you, how do you handle the pollutants that are in that storm water that is coming in is really what we're looking at. Um, reducing nitrogen, phosph phosphates, those are the things you're really kind of looking at. Hydrocarbons, that's what this program is really geared towards. Uh, quality versus quantity, which is quantity is what we've been managing for the last 20, 30 years. <laughs> And, and so, again, it's, so you're talking about what you're not allowed to contribute to this. And my question also says, does our existing system have the capability of what is allowed to be contributed if we start doing more dense housing and stuff like that? And you're, are you saying that the state law basically won't allow anybody to build that is contributing anything more than is presently being contributed? Yes, that's the way yeah. the state law is set up. But we, yeah. but we do, we do have sections of the system which are inadequate, and at some point we will have to deal with those inadequacies, just just in general. Yeah, I mean, it's it just to say, you know, doing a doing an override for sewers is not exactly sexy. So. Oh, I think it is. It's yeah. wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Exactly on the problem that we're going to have to confront, and that is that uh, we either pay for it with some current fee structure in case we then we have to either um, pass an override to increase taxes or we have to otherwise cut expenses to fund, 
or we have to create a new funding stream, which is, of course, why I think Northampton got into the situation that Bernie and Paul at the um, council meeting uh, referenced. Um, Dorothy, and then uh, Kathy. So Dorothy? Uh, just a question. Since this is a relatively new state requirement or refinement of requirements, are there any grants or money that towns can apply for to help with this? There's limited grants right now, which is a lot of different a lot of municipalities complain about it's sort of an unfunded mandate. There is a, a Mass DEP grant program this year. There was really two grants that came out of Mass DEP for MS4, um, and one was strictly for nonprofits, and and another was for um, when towns work together, sort of as a as a coalition. So if you were a part of a coalition or if you were a part of a nonprofit and you were going to help with MS4 in some way, you could apply for a grant from Mass DEP. But I, I am hopeful that they're going to start developing some larger grants for this program. It would make sense. Kathy? Um, uh, Guilford, you said it's a state requirement that the new development can't have any more stormwater discharge than before. How do we know that um, that, that is the case? Who, who, who enforces that requirement? How do you know it? How do you know that um, a very large building that is now on a piece of land that used to have a house on it um, doesn't generate any more stormwater? So that's actually one of the things our engineering department does for the planning department. When a permit comes in, they have to submit their stormwater calculations. It's also for some conservation projects they submitted as well. Jason Skills, the town engineer, takes that information. And he runs the calculations and verifies that they, their post stormwater discharge is less than or equal to their pre discharge. And that's what the permitting is that we're talking about the stormwater permitting. When a project, a new development or a redevelopment comes forward, they, their stormwater design needs to get permitted. And as Guilford said, it would get reviewed by DPW engineering prior to issuing the permit. And then that does happen right now through, as Guilford said, through, the, through some of the planning processes that we have right now. But this program um, would basically clarify that process a lot. Um, and also uh, the standards are, are changing, MS4, standards for water quality and water volume is a little more restrictive than the current Massachusetts stormwater handbook, which is what the CONCOM is using and the um, and we review to right now, but MS4 is a little stricter. Do, can, uh, this is a little bit aside from just stormwater, but do we have a similar calculation for draw on water and draw on sewage capacity? Yeah. So we are more dense, do we? Uh, reach a point we're worried about a water supply or or sewage um, processing capacity. We we do when someone submits a development plan, we do look at sewer capacity and we do look at water capacity. What we find what we've been finding is that we have the wastewater treatment plant has the capacity to handle the, the sewage, but we'll find localized problems in the system where the system has to be upgraded, where the pipes are too small in that one area. And maybe the developer will have to upgrade, you know, a couple hundred feet or a thousand feet or hasn't been, well, some of them have actually had to do almost half a mile of sewer upgrades to uh, get the sewage to the plant because the old pipes won't hold that. Um, water is a little different. Our water system, we're sitting pretty good at, with water quality or water quantity. Um, for development right now. We're actually doing really, really well. Thank you. Bob Hegner. Yeah, I, I, I just had a thought and that is that um, rainwater is not um, pure. <laughs> it's got pollutants in it. Um, I think, I believe nitrogen and ammonium is fairly high or can be fairly high in rainwater. Uh, are we supposedly uh, taking into account what 
the concentrations are of water hitting the hitting hitting the ground, or it, it, do we have to clean it to a standard irrespective of what the background is coming in at? No, yeah, it would be the standard EPA is setting are sort of based on that background level of what you know current rainwater. Like you said, there's acid rain everywhere now, especially in the Northeast. So, yeah, they're based on that okay. as a background. So I'm going to turn the subject a little bit and hope that the committee will come uh, help help us along. But you know. I, we don't have to produce a report right now. We have 90 days to do that. And the question is how to use the 90 days effectively. And um, it seems to me that one of the things that I had mentioned earlier, I wanna come, come back to and make sure that we get, and that is the experience from other towns that have implemented the system already. Uh, Northampton being one example, East Longmeadow was another one that Beth had put into the original presentation uh, that she made in the memo to the uh, council. And, uh, but to find out, you know, what their experience has been on both the uh, expense side and the revenue side so that we can make sure that uh, we're advising appropriately that the bylaw is uh, being developed in a way that can accommodate the change. Uh, some of the bylaws written uh, gives options really for implementation down the line and doesn't establish a strict structure, just gives uh, options for a structure. And that's fine, but I think that we at least need to understand it and be able to comment to the council about it. Um, are there other things that uh, the committee can um, has thought about that would be helpful information for us to have as we ponder what we want to report back to the council. Um, the, the only one, Andy, it's, I think it's the same thing of finding out what other communities have done, but if, if we did do, went the utility route down the road and just faced how do we set the fees, more information than um, where we see variance, more information on the implications if you go the impervious versus per, uh, or, or per housing unit, of what people have done if we have examples, one went one way and one went another. And so we know something about implementation costs, uh, maintenance costs going versus that. So Lynn's basic question of you can't set up a utility until you've got revenues coming in, understanding what underlies those revenues and what choices will we would have to make, getting more information to inform those choices would be great. Dorothy, did you have anything there? Uh, yes, this is uh, following up on what Guilford said about um, large buildings having to equalize their, their water. Um, is this a new requirement or was it in effect when One East Pleasant and Kendrick were built? And if it was, what uh, were their mitigations or was it decided that since there'd been some parking lot in that area that it was impervious then? And I'm just curious to know, has this been applied into some of the recent um, larger constructions? And if so, how? Oh. Yes, it's been applied in the recent constructions. Um, One East Pleasant was actually, they had an easier time because it was a fully developed parcel and everything was paved on the parcel pretty much. So their post runoff was basically a whole lot because their pre runoff was a whole lot. Um, One East Pleasant, or not One East Pleasant. Um, Kendrick? Place? Yeah, Kend Kendrick Place is the one that was up. That one was a really stickler because basically that was a green green grass lot. There was like two pieces of concrete pads that were no more than 10 feet square on that parcel. That was the only impervious land on those parcels. Mm -hmm. um, everything else was pervious. So they actually had to put in some underground detention chambers, um, which holds the water and slowly release the water at the post 
at the pre-release uh, rates. So that one was the harder building to build because it was, yes, it was mostly a grass lot that was converted mm -hmm. to 100% impervious. Um, is that why, I may have, been, may have remembered something of this. Uh, they originally had thought they were gonna do some underground parking, but they couldn't because of this. Is, is that a possible connection? Um, they couldn't do underground parking because the groundwater table was so high. <laughs> All right. The screen that runs underneath there. Yeah. Thank you. Very informative. C can I say one more thing about the bylaws before you? Sure. So you're, you're being asked to recommend the bylaws. And what we've told you or what we've given you here is, is future cost. And we know that it's going to take a while to put this all together. Um, but we are, this is a permit we're required to do. And this is just step one, is approving the IDDE bylaw and the stormwater bylaw. Um, how we implement them going forward, we have probably one to two, maybe even three years to actually think this out and figure up how we want to do this. Um, nothing we have in our estimate of cost, cost for the next three years is actually more than we, what we've put into the capital plan for the next five years in the, in the joint capital plan. So we do have time. It's not, don't feel like you're rushed to make a decision on the enterprise system or the stormwater utility. Um, what we're, we're, we're eating, I keep saying this, we're eating this elephant one bite at a time. Bite one is to pass the two bylaws and then we can move on to the next couple of bites and move down the road. Yeah, and I think that what we're uh, probably starting at, and that was very helpful, Guilford, is to make sure that as we look at the bylaw itself, that we're comfortable that the bylaw gives us the full range of options that we may want to consider down the line. Uh, so that, because as has been pointed out, at the uh, council meeting where this was originally discussed, uh, it's easier to uh, do things in, by um, implementation of a bylaw than to go back and have to revise the bylaw again. So we're hoping we get the bylaw right. And I think that's part of what we're after doing, making sure that we do through this discussion and the analysis that follows. <laughs> Uh, other thoughts from the committee on this subject? Because if not, then we can uh, thank uh, Beth and Guilford and move on to the uh, quarterly report for the second quarter. And uh, the other thing, I know we have one um, attendee who's somebody who uh, pays a lot of attention to financial matters. So. Uh, if a um, member of the public at any time thinks about something that um, they would want to have, um, want, want to raise during public comment, uh, you could go ahead and raise your hand and at least I know that I need to move up public comment earlier in the agenda to make sure that I can accommodate the public comment that um, we very much welcome. So having said that, uh, we will turn, but um, I think um, if uh, nobody has anything else for either Guilford or Beth now, um, then thank you very much for being with us today. I appreciate it. And, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Sean and Sonia um, to present the quarter report and I guess just get it, uh, make sure that we have an understanding with Lynn as to who's putting it on the screen. Yeah, I, which one are you wanting to look at, the first or second quarter? Well, the first quarter report, um, it's posted on the, both reports are posted on the um, accounting website right now, but the first quarter report is really less significant because the budget isn't set yet. We haven't, we haven't set a tax rate. So the revenues were still moving around. Now the tax rate is set. So the second quarter report is much more significant. So okay. I, I was planning on just going through that one. All right, let me go to the second quarter report. That's the one you want? 
It is. Um, so I'll, I'll start by saying that these are pretty typical from, from year to year and quarter to quarter. You can see the percentage collected from, from a budget on a normal year, but what's happened with COVID in fiscal year 21, we had to cut the budget quite a bit. So it's kind of, that's also insignificant to try to compare um, where we're at collected to a much smaller bed budget. So for this year, I created a, another report, which is scroll all the way to the end. And that compares revenues to what we collected last year at the same time. So if you go to the top of that, and that's what I kind of want to go through just so you can see, because right, really the budgets, even though they are significant, they're kind of insignificant. You want to see what we collected from the previous year and why. Is this what you want? That's it. So um, first thing is the uh, golf golf course. We, we budgeted nothing for the golf course this year because we figured there wouldn't be a lot of participation with that. It turns out we had a better um, first two quarters than we've had in, pre in um, previous years. We actually took in 40% more than the year before at this time. So we did pretty well for the golf course this year. Um, recreation, that's another place where we cut, we pretty much cut the budget down to zero because of the programs we weren't we weren't going to be able to run so it seemed it was logical to cut those down however um pools were open and again pools did better this year than they've done in the previous year i think we did 72 percent better for the same period now this is just for the first six months all the way across in the, from 2018 19 and 20. uh fees are new this year we don't budget them those are the cannabis those are the cannabis cannabis host fees and the short term rental fees. I'm sorry, I have to keep it over on my computer because I can't see the screen. <laughs> I'm looking over at my, my desktop. Then we have fines. Um, the budget was reduced significantly. We've already close to reached that budget and we're on target for what came in previous year. Investment income, we've actually exceeded what we were budgeted for. So thanks to our treasurer, she's been really good at investing as much money as she can and she moves it at the last minute. So she does a really good job with that. Inve um, then we have license and permits. We're 67.3% collected, but 37% less than the, than the previous year on this. So. We're doing okay. I we're going to meet our budget estimates, but we are lower than the previous years at this time. Medicaid reimbursements. We usually collect these in June. However, they are going to be lower with the schools being out. Miscellaneous non-recurring. This is where we normally have our hot hotel moat our UMass fees that are in lieu of hotel motel. Um, taxes and they've been closed so we're not expecting to collect any of that this year and so far that's held true. Uh, we will be collecting from Amherst College this year. We used to get the 120 from UMass here but we're we're still negotiating a new strategic partnership agreement which is on hold because of COVID. Was 120 the schools money or this was payment move taxes. But that was, um, that's hotel motel. That's okay. Got it. Yeah. Motor vehicle excise. We collect the bulk of that in February. So we'll see where that goes in the next quarterly report. Other revenue is where most of the department, the miscellaneous department revenue is. We are a little bit lower on that, but we're on track to meet our, our budget estimate here. Other excise, hotel motel is way down from the previous years. Meals tax is doing much better than we anticipated. It's already reached our budget um, but that we, um, 
projected for this year. However, we're still about 48% lower than previous years. Cannab cannabis tax, these are new. It's on target for what we got last year. We normally don't budget for these, um, these funds until we've had some more trend. We didn't budget for it this year. Penalties and interest. We had a large deferral payment in fiscal year 20. So that's why that seems a little inflated, but other than that, we're on target, actually doing a little better than we expected for that. Pilot, it's on target. These, are, these come in as just as transfers. Real property tax, we're right on target. Collections are still good. We're gonna meet our 98 to 99% this year. Rentals, the rental um, budget was reduced significantly. However, we've already collected what we budgeted for and we expect that to be exceeded. Special assessment, assessments is just timing of when the PBTA assessment payment comes in from UMass and the five colleges. It'll probably more than likely be in the second, third quarter. State aid, it's on target and there were no cuts. I just wanted to point that out. There were no cuts, which is a good thing. Transfer in are just normal. Um, it's free and the indirect costs from the enterprise funds and any community preservation fund money that we budget for, for um, debt service, anything that we budget from free cash overlay or ambulance that shows up there and it's just an internal transfer. And then, I don't know, do you want me to do the sewer? I'll do the, I'll do the enterprise fund revenues here too. Enterprise fund revenues, we reduced, we've been doing a lot of adjusting to our budgets, not just due to COVID, but due to the um, consumption going down. So we've raised rates, we've reduced our consumption projections and we've come pretty close. We're down 8% from this time last year. However, um, UMass is closed. So we would have more than likely done much better if it wasn't for, for the COVID here. Same with water. And we budget our sewer revenues at 85% of consumption of water. Uh, water rate, again, the same thing as sewer. We're down 9% from this time last year. Solid waste are actually doing a little better. I think a lot of people have been staying home cleaning their yards and, and their houses and bringing stuff in. Transportation, this is the problem child. <laughs> the only revenue that the transportation fund receives is from parking meters and parking violations. And we cut the budget significantly here, but we're, we are down 56% from this time last year in revenues. So this is gonna be an issue that we're gonna to have to uh, figure out what we're gonna do. I'll probably end up having to move some expenses into the general fund, reallocate employees to different places, which we've done some of that already. So this is on the revenue side. So revenues are coming in very slowly. So on the so, general fund expense side, do you, do you want, want me to take questions on stop. revenues or wait to the end? See if there's any revenue questions that people have. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, my, my big concern is this transportation up here when PDTA and UMass finally get their act together in February because that's there's been such fluctuation. I'm trying to find it. Uh, there's been such fluctuation in bus usage and schedule and stuff like that. So do we have any inkling of that one? So that lags, Lynn, that yeah. looks at um, the, the reimbursement for that comes from prior years. It's based on prior year usage. Um, so we shouldn't have any issues this year with it. It may linger into future years when, when this year catches up. Yeah, right here, I guess, is where. No, that's not it. Yeah, I'm just concerned about that because it's it's something to keep our eye on because yep. of in future years. 
and then the other one that Sonia already pointed out. Okay. Where, where do you want to go next? Or Andy, is there anybody? Um, I'm just saying if there are anybody raised hands to ask revenue questions, but if not, then we'll go on to expenses. I yes. think Kathy has her hand up. Yes. Do it, trying. Um, yeah, I have, uh, I think I have uh, three. Um, on the Medicaid, the drop, I understand why it's dropping. Does that show up as schools lose revenue? Is that where that revenue is allocated? So it's just a, where does it show up in the school budget? Uh, no, we don't, we don't specifically hold the schools accountable for it. It all, it all goes into that pie that we carve up for all the budgets. Okay. And um, in theory, we're allocating it to the school, but and we are, but we're, we won't hold them. Okay. Then the, for it. then the second one is on meal tax. Um, this is more on a what, uh, to what extent if UMass is um, delivering food and selling food to residents of town and they're bringing it to you, do they pay a meal tax? I don't know if UMass pays a meal tax. No. They must, right, Sean? To be honest with you. We can, we can find out, the confirm the answer to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's just Actually, that is an interesting question and I did do some research on that subject. Uh, because somebody else had raised the question and I looked at the uh, uh, state statute and regulations and uh, the university is responsible to collect meals tax and it should be coming to the town. And at some point I was going to ask that question too to make sure that we we're actually receiving the revenue that uh, my interpretation of the statute says that we're entitled to receive. Uh, and uh, the, um, I did add, do some asking around, including of uh, one of our counselors who regularly eats on campus and uh, indicates that when he pays cash um, at say the blue wall, um, that uh, if it's a meal that is an individually paid for meal, then he then there is a sale is uh, meals tax applied. And my understanding of it is that it should be coming to the town. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty certain they do pay meals tax, but that would go directly to the state. We would get it back as on uh, quarterly on uh, monthly through the cherry sheet revenue coming in. So it goes to the state. They don't give us a breakdown of which hotels or which, I mean, which um, restaurants are paying how much in tax. We just get the lump sum from the state. Yeah, and we, we can reach out to our, our rep that we talk to frequently and see if there's, if they, if she can look and see where that's coming from to verify whether we're getting a good amount from UMass. Um, so we'll, we'll follow up on that. Okay. You know, it's... Yeah, and then my other one, uh, again, it's just focusing on revenues, is you've got two places where you're getting, there's revenue from cannabis. One's an impact and one's a fee. And I, when I added it up, it's about 173,000. And I know you said it wasn't budgeted. Where does that money go? Does it just go into a general fund right now? Does general it- General fund money, yes. The DR um, says it has to go into the general fund. So one of them is the tax itself which comes through the cherry sheet. The other is the, um, what's the word, impact fees. Impact fee, right. That come in and it just, it comes in directly to the town and it goes there in fees. Now all of this gets closed out to free cash. So in the future, when we finally figure out what we're gonna do and use this money towards, the, the vote will have to come from free cash. So keep, everybody needs to keep that in mind. We can't put it in a separate fund. The only amount that we're allowed to put into a separate fund is a donation part that's in, in some of the agreements. John, you'd probably know more about that one. Yeah, so there, there's sort of three streams of money, maybe more, but there's three sort of primary streams of money that we get from these host agreements. Um, one is the tax, which is is less restricted in its use. And, and as Sonia said, we're just, waiting to get a couple of years of trend before we actually budget it. Um, and this year is gonna be a funny year because of the pandemic to see what, what that looks like. And we also have more um, establishments opening. So we're trying to get a sense of what the, the normal level of revenues will look like. 
Um, the second thing is the impact fee. That's restricted in its usage. Um, it can only be used on what, you know, what we identify as impacts of the dispensaries. And so um, it is in reserves. And so as Sonia said, we've got to remember that, uh, you know, I think it's about maybe a little over 200,000 of our reserves right now are actually attributed to those impact fees. And so th they're restricted in use when we want to use them, we have to use them for specific things. And then the third is a, is a donation um, that's made annually. That's, um, we're really just sort of a holder of it. It's, it's meant for education and um, awareness and th that would go to a, a nonprofit of some sort. Right, and impact fees might not be recurring, a recurring well, revenue to where the tax is. Okay. Any more revenue questions? Yeah, that, in, that answered my question, yep. Mm, Pat? Uh, yeah, um, uh, you said that, Sean, the donation would be going for education and something and um, at, would be going annually for education and you said something else awareness yeah i'll send the um i'll have to get the exact blurb um there's there's a there's a section in the host agreements that speaks specifically to um uh the sort of education awareness piece so I'll, i can send the exact blurb so you have more um, clarity about that okay and it probably is education and awareness about cannabis usage or i believe so but let me i'll send the exact language back to the group thank you very much hon Okay. Okay. Anything now. Else? Oops. Not, on, not on revenues. So um, there's not on the expense side and the general fund. There's there's not any concerns at this point. All the department heads have been really great at um, controlling their expenses. Between that and our COVID, our CARES money. We've been able to keep um, the town running pretty smoothly without any glitches. Any of the budgets that you see that are over 50% spent at this time are due to timing issues, you know, like retirement that we pay up front, all our relicensing fees for software that we pay up front. And um, in miscellaneous and insurance, we have to pay for our property and casualty insurance up front. And we pay for both. We pay up front for the town, the region, the elementary school and the library, and then we bill them back and, and the money comes down. So if you see your, I think the percentage in there shows 107% overspent, that will go back down to normal once the allocations, they pay us their portions and the allocations go back in there. Um, and also there's encumbrances for contracts that are in there like snow and ice. There's a large um, encumbrance in there for salt and sand. And as that, um, as we get closer and closer to the end of winter and hope, hope there's no more snowstorms, they don't, if they don't use that full encumbrance that ends up going back in. So those are the only anomalies that I have in there. The other thing is, I know there was questions about the eighty thousand dollars that was voted at the um, at the um, la last um, budget process. That is sitting right now into a, in a control account, and it's I just we just have instructions from the town manager to move it to the town manager's budget in a separate line, so that we can track the expenditures that come on here and make it available for um, the group that's studying this right now. So I believe the only thing that is, nothing's been spent from it, it's still $80,000. I think there's gonna be some stipends paid out of there and I'm, I'm not sure what else at this point. Yeah, just, uh, just, to, just to add to that, there's, um, yeah, nothing's been spent yet. There are some anticipated stipends for the working group um, but we don't know exactly how much yet, um, but it, it won't use most of it. It'll be a small portion of the budget. Right. And, and then Sean, they're talking about hiring a consultant to help them with it that. Would that, that yeah, it would come out of that same bucket of money. Yep. Um, the important thing to remember is that, um, you know, that money is good for stuff performed in FY21. Um, it would, that, those funds would restart for the next fiscal year. And they are going to restart for the next fiscal year. Do you know? Uh, I at this point we're still going through the budget process, but I haven't heard anything to the to you know. I'm sure. Yeah. Not, yeah. 
And okay, and it's for social justice and equity work. So it could move beyond uh, the uh, community safety working group. It, where it's being applied right now is totally appropriate. But I'm just wondering over time whether there'll be other um, ways of funding programs or things like that. Yeah, it could it could broaden in its scope of what it, you know other social justice initiatives. Um, or other public uh, community safety initiatives. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, because we're going to have some service changes and stuff. Thank you. Yeah. It is, a, it is a new fund, so we don't really know. It was established this year. It's, it's a first time, uh, as we have other expenses running through, and every year we balancing um, our revenues against our expenses. We don't know what we're going to what. It's going to be proposed for future years, but I thank you for bringing it up and giving the report. Um, Kathy, you have your hand up. Do you want me to finish with the enterprise funds? No, no. Can you just stay on this page? I had uh, some questions um, just so I understand what we're spending money on. So in the um, North Amherst and Cushman School, the Amherst Community Child Care Facility, the South Amherst School Building, um, the East Street School, East Street School is, some of these are closed. So if we see money, so like East Street School, is that repair or maintenance costs? Um, and so, so same question on each of those. What, what are North Amherst School is rented out to an entity? So I don't it's all, know. It's all for repairs and okay. utilities and it's facilities cost. Okay, so um, I think, um, some of them are apportioned a, a part of a custodian who maintains the building. Right. Uh, and as Sonia said, utilities. Um, yeah. Any okay. plumbing issues that come up? Any? And the same thing is for bangs. That's that's um, it's that's not staffing, right? Because you show that. No, there's staff. There is staffing. There is oh, staffing. That, in that one has staffing. In it. So the other um, is. They pretty much all do. Munson does. Um, East Street School does not. We share. There is some. I think, I think they all have a little bit there's of There's one custody and that's, that's apportioned out to all the different buildings. Okay. So there is staffing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we want to move on down then. I don't see anyone else is raising hands so we can continue on with the expenditures. Okay, um, so uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about the expenditures. Um, there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing, no concerns at this point on the expense side. Uh, there's gonna be some savings and we may need that savings for the transportation fund. So that's to offset some of those revenue deficits. Sonia, do you wanna to speak to the, the one other question we had about if there were um, accessibility improvements um, if there was an emergency repair, what we would, how we would pay for that? Yeah, I just want to finish up with with the rest of the uh, enterprise funds. Okay. On the expense side, everything is is um, like the general fund. Everything's pretty normal as it should be at this point. There's no concerns on the expense side, other than trying to just keep them down so that we meet our revenue estimates because um, enterprise funds, you can't overspend your operating budget but you need to bring it is illegal it is legal to have a revenue deficit we just don't want to so if you don't spend all your operating budget it nets that deficit in revenue down so we're trying to keep it so that it's a zero net result which is not always possible but i just wanted to point that out and uh yeah sean the other question was about emergencies what it, that would that would depend on the emer the type of emergency. I mean, the DOR regulates a lot of these emergency things, so it depends on whether it's affecting the health and safety of citizens, of residents of Amherst or employees. It depends. It just depends. So I, I would need more clarity on what the emergency would be. Sometimes we, if it's like the water pipes burst down at the North Amherst. Um, fire department. We had them pay for it out of their operating budget, knowing there would be a deficit there for that. And then we we offset it by savings. And if we needed to, we would have asked for a reserve 
for a uh, an appropriation from reserves, but we didn't end up needing to. So a lot of things depend on what the situation is. If there's a specific question, a specific emergency, I can be more specific. Yeah, I, no, there was no, I'm sorry. There was yeah, no, go ahead, Matt, because I'm, you were good. There was no specific emergency. The committee, the um, Disability Access Advisory Committee has a new member from, and that person uh, works at UMass where they do have an ongoing emergency fund. And she was talking about the committee controlling a fund like that. Uh, so there wasn't a specific emergency, but if all, if all of a sudden there was something wrong with a ramp to the bang center or something like that, that was impacting um, people with mobility issues, how would that be? We have capital articles out there for um, building envelopes. So if something like that were to happen, we could we could use that depending on what the balance is and in, in the emergency. We used to have when we were a town meeting form of government, we had a reserve fund transfer, which was under the purview of the finance committee. And it was usually a hundred thousand dollars, and it was for these unforeseen types of things. With with council government, we don't have that anymore. That's because we can meet more often and have appropriations, emergency wow. appropriations happen, where with town meeting, it was only twice a year. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Pat, I'll add one more quick thing. Um, we are planning in the capital improvement program to start putting aside a set amount of money every year for accessibility improvements. Oh, great. Um, so you'll, you'll see that this year, you know, specifically broken out in the capital improvement program. Um, some ongoing money to, to start making some improvements um, that we, you know, we learned as part of the study. Great, thank you very much. Um, a quick, quick question, this regional debt assessment, what is that? Regional schools are allowed to have debt too, Lynn, all right, it's not just, <laughs> no, right. so, the, so the, this is the Amherst assessment from the regional schools based on the regional agreement for the town share of the debt. Um, so this would be according to a debt schedule maintained by the region of all the projects they've approved. Um, mm -hmm. So if they ever in the future um, approve a new roof or approve, um, you know, some major project, this is where you would see that cost hit. And, um, you know, that comes to the, the council gets to weigh in on that every year when the schools bring their budget forward. They also bring forward a debt um, assessment for approval as well. And that that shows up on the debt service budget in the seven thousand numbers. Not that, that means anything to anybody, but it shows up there. <laughs> it shows up there um, as part of our debt service. I we just have to put it in the in the books as an educational expense. So I carve that out of the debt service and put it up into the education. So it's really their debt service, but it gets paid out of the capital budget just like our regular current debt. So just to refresh my memory, uh, we pay this as they spend or do we transfer the amount that is budgeted every year? Um, so it's typically after the fact. So once they approve a project, they will typically do temporary borrowing to complete the project. And then once the project's complete, they will then assess us our, our portion of it um, over a certain number of years, depending on the size. Okay. Thank you. Anything else in the way of questions? So I, I mean, I think your bottom line statement at the beginning, if I have it correctly, is that uh, it, uh, when we take the amount of money that we had, the adjusted budget, and we're looking at it against the adjusted budget, we're, we're feeling comfortable with where you're at. 51.7%. Yes. I am. That's the key takeaway. It's not, the comparison to prior years is helpful to let us know where we're at, but we didn't expect to ever, that we would have the revenues to do everything that we did in prior years. But we did so much better than than we expected to. So thought it was a good story. In part because of, I assume, uh, the Federal Stimulus Cares Act funding funding. Not on the revenue side, that didn't really do much for our revenues. The revenues is a good story all on its own. 
Okay. Other questions about the quarter budget? Tony Cunningham has her hand up. Yeah. So I will turn to public comment then um, and uh, ask that uh, Tony be brought in so that she can uh, ask question or make comment uh, since she has raised her hand and gone to that, we went on her that. Hi, Tony. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, this is really interesting information. Thanks, Anya, for that. Um, so I'm, I'm, my question is about the Centennial Water Treatment Plant. So when it was uh, approved, the estimate was $11 million and it was in for FY22. The town manager made a comment at the very end of the meeting last night that indicated the cost has gone up, but he didn't specify by how much. So with the revenues for the water fund down 11% and the projected debt for the plant um, improvements, as well as the well for improvements, close to 1 million per year. I'm just wondering if there's an update or if the finance committee will get an update on what the rates need to be to cover that. Is there enough in the reserves of the waterfront? And if, the, if there is not enough revenue or in the reserves, what happens to cover that debt service? Where do, where do you go? Do you increase the water rates or do you go to the general fund? Does it come out of ongoing capital? Um, how does that uh, cost impact our other needs in town? Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Sean or Sonia, do you have a response that you can offer? Um, so we, we will be looking at water rates um, relatively soon. We've already, I mean, Sonia and I have already started working on them, but they will be coming to the finance committee um, where we do look out four or five years. So you will see the impact of Centennial. Um, there are reserves in the fund that could cover some overages um, we are seeing a reduction in consumption, but we are anticipating that to be somewhat temporary once um, universities get back, the university and the college get back to normal. We anticipate that the consumption will go back up, um, but we'll have to wait and see what that looks like. Um, if, if we don't have enough between our reserves and, and other cost savings, um, you know, I'll look to Sonia, but we would, if, if more debt needed to be authorized, we'd have to get permission for more debt to be authorized. Um, but we're not at that point yet. We're still we're still looking at this year and and projecting out forward. I saw a couple of hands up, but just to confirm, the uh, prior practice, and I assume the continuing practice would be that this would any overage would be covered through the enterprise fund, not by transfer from the general fund. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I think, I believe so. Okay, uh, Lynn. And I assume that as with just about anything that's construction these days, it's cost in materials and labor. It's driving the cost up. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to um, connect with Guilford on this yet. So I, I'd wanna check in with him more before I weigh in on, on that, um, on that comment. Thank you. Kathy? So if, if you do, could we just get an update on it at the next finance committee meeting? You know, it's, as, as everyone remembers, we heard about the 11 million almost after the fact. We just, it would just be nice to know if that 11 million has turned into something significantly higher or not. I'm talking about the construction part, not the study part. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, oh, we'll bring back an update. But I think that's a good segue to the, one of the next topics. <laughs> yes. So, uh, we actually can move the agenda along then to the subject of the uh, uh, plans for the committee, the goals for the committee and the meeting schedule. Lynn, did you have that um, document that I sent around as a Word document earlier today? And if not, I'll, I can share it out of my computer. Um, I have it. Okay. And I just want to apologize since it's my document for all of the screwy stuff on it, but well, yeah. Uh, oh, I, I had taken the, uh, <laughs> when I sent it out, I think I did it without comments, but they uh, showing, but they do show as, as they are now. What I did was I extracted from uh, a memo that Lynn had sent to the council and had asked that we look at it for the um, financial goals of 
um, for both the council and the committee for the year. And um, I took the pieces that were um, applicable in some sense and uh, put them into a single document so that uh, we would then uh, skim out the things that we wouldn't have to look at the things that were involved with other committees. Um, but it drives sort of what our thinking is about our work plan needs in um, the time ahead. And then um, we'll get to the last piece, which is the actual meeting schedule, which is, um, has some wrinkles to it that I explained too. Uh, Lynn, did you have anything you wanted to say to us about what your thinking was or what you were looking for in comments on this? One of my goals this year um, is to actually see to the extent possible that we can map out a calendar for the year, uh, knowing that there will be shifts in it. And so the purpose, is, the purpose of this memo, with, of which this is a part, um, was to make sure that I know everything that needs to go on that calendar, as well as the council then being able to say for things that are quote optional, what are their top priorities? So my, this whole memo, which is extensive, was to make sure I haven't missed something. And even now, I mean, I think the last time I messed with this thing was sometime in very early January or late December. And I already can see things as well. So it's something that I wanted both finance committee and the finance staff to look at and say, okay, what are we looking at? What do we make, need to make sure goes on here? And of course, the uh, what uh, Sean is referring to and he was, uh, I believe, referring to and he was talking about <clears throat> in relation to the immediately previous discussion was the set water and sewer rates analysis of alternative ways of setting water and sewer rates were things that had previously been identified by this committee and uh, that would need to get into our work schedule at an appropriate point. And uh, Can we make this bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I should have printed it out. Okay. Tell me if that's enough, Pat. Is that enough? Yeah. If you go up to review at, at the top and then uh, yeah, put the mark, no, no markup, right? You don't show markup. Yeah. Then it'll. Yeah don't show the markup, then it'll make it easier to look at. There. No. Uh, simple markup, you wanna go? Yeah, go back in. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so Kathy, uh, you had been the one who raised this question, you have been raising this question at the earliest. Um, and I think that the question that uh, you and Bernie then had talked about was to look at whether there are other ways of uh, setting water and sewer rates and whether we should be examining them. And I think that uh, if we're gonna do that in time for the water rate setting, we probably need to get that on a fairly early agenda um, in February. And, and Bernie and I have not followed up on it, partly because we didn't connect with each other. We were going to go to Guilford. We'd, we'd written out some ideas and talk with him to get him to um, do some scenarios of what would happen if we did this or that, with some, put some numbers on it. Um, and I had it on my list for the fall and forgot, um, basically, would be the explanation of where that went. So Bernie... You know, we we done a. If everyone might remember, we did a memo with some specifics, um, and people we talked about it. And my understanding is, we, you authorized the two of us to go off and 
have a conversation with Guilford to see what we could get back. And these wouldn't be formal. These would be more a first look to see whether we want to do anything. And I think, Andy, we were not talking about FY22 as much as FY23, because some of it would be Guilford wanted to get a more, um, if we want to go that route, he wanted to get a more sophisticated estimate. But basically, we need to even make a decision whether we want to get the more sophisticated estimate of it. Does that sound right to you, Bernie? Yeah. It's okay. yeah, that, sounds, that sounds pretty good. Sean, you had your hand up. Yeah, that, that was, I was gonna say, that was my recollection too, that it, it wouldn't be for the FY22 rates, it would be for the next cycle, um, but that we still wanted to move forward this year with, with doing the analysis. Um, the other one thing that jumps out to me that's missing, um, not a big thing, but is um, reviewing other post-employment benefits. We, that's actually something we could do relatively soon because we just completed our report. And I think that typically will come to finance committee um, when the actuary completes the report. So you could, I would put that near like the annual audit because it would be an annual recurring item. No, the, uh, the thought was that we would only do that with the finance committee, but not the entire council, that OPEB is such that uh, taking it to the, having the full council hear from the actuary may be a little bit over the top. Anything else that people see or have questions about when they ask about? We'll have to scroll down through the rest of it. it was, yeah. Uh, we should, don't, shouldn't we put the uh, stormwater bylaws in here? Yeah. I don't see them. Yeah. Yeah, that probably should. Is it two or four? Right two. now we're only dealing with two. 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 I thought there were two. Stormwater and illicit discharge. Yes. I'm just gonna do a little something to help me later on. Okay. Um, Andy, um, you, I mean, I don't know, you may want to put something in there just about reviewing bylaws in general, or there, I can imagine other ones maybe coming forward this year, and sometimes those can take time. Um, I don't know if you're only looking for specific things or just things that you might want to factor in when you're setting the calendar. Uh, could put in a review additional bylaws as assigned. Yeah, I'm thinking if there's new bylaws proposed throughout the year, the ones that would come to the committee. Yeah, usually we don't only do that if we think that there are financial implications to possible financial implications to the bylaws. Otherwise, it's not necessary to refer to this committee. Kathy? Um, my question is more about uh, timing on the fees. You know, Sean, when I'm looking at the fees that are listed there, the parking fees and maybe other fees, um, do you have a sense, um, you had mentioned, I think last fall or even the spring, that you were 
looking through these. Um, I have a sheet that I, a memo, and I just didn't know how far along you are. And I had a set of ideas and should I just send them to you? Or are you about to come to us with this and, and I should wait? Yeah, so we decided, we, you know, we looked at them this year and we decided to hold off on changing fees because of the pandemic um, with everything going on. We didn't, we didn't think it was a good time to make any dramatic changes to it. Um, but definitely send them to me. You know, what I envision a process could look like is, you know, we look at these in the fall and if we're going to make any changes, you know, we would, we would give enough time for them uh, in advance to notify people of changes. Um, so they might go into effect July 1st. Um, similar to our budget, but there's nothing set in stone about that. But if you have any specific um, fees you want us to look at, send them to me and, and we'll take a look. Okay. And then Lynn, Lynn, on the larger council issue, um, this would be um, normally a TSO issue because it's a use of uh, public ways. Uh, would, if, if a counselor has specific ideas about this, can I I was going to just send it directly to Sean, and then it would would it come back to the extent sh town staff like them or don't like them comes back to the council, or would it be better to start with the council? Uh, I'd I'd send them to Sean. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm going to see if anybody else has hands up for suggestions or questions. Go on. Italics, by the way, are required ones. The non-italics are not. So I'm going to go back up here and place this in italics. And this is, is assigned. And this is already in italics. Okay. You want to look down the next below this, Andy? Yes, go ahead. This, since uh, <coughs> I have it in front of them, otherwise. It's one of these we can actually say it's underway. We're like 75% done with it. <laughs> so. Hey. <laughs> Almost there. So the actually the uh, where we left the capital improve uh, the capital inventory was we said let's adopt what we had for this year and we could review it at the end of the year for any recommendations we might have for uh, the following year. So that review. She can. Yeah. Um, well, I'm typing at a very strange angle, just so we know. I mean, I'm not going to brag about my typing skills, but. If I, if it were me, they wouldn't be done. Okay. Hey. Okay. Of course, through the four capital projects, we were going to come back uh, and uh, Sean will be making a presentation, I believe, to the Finance Committee, uh, possibly in February, regarding uh, a review of where we are, where, where the model is now, and uh, the funding options. Uh, and it's one of the questions that you should answer um, is whether or not you as chair or whoever's chair uh, will be willing to make that open to all counselors. They can either come as audience or they could, we could have it be a committee of the whole. Uh, you and I can talk about that later, but uh, yeah. certainly it's always available to all counselors. Um, I think that would that's what we had concluded. Can to. Uh, 
and uh, whether to make it a meeting of the hall, I think is a discretionary question for you as president. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I, the practice is I'm supposed to check with the chair before declaring such a thing. <laughs> yes. So we can talk about that. Um, Dorothy has her hand up. Dorothy? Um, I want to speak in favor of inefficiency. Sometimes having something done in one meeting is very efficient, but sometimes hearing it at several meetings, really the facts begin to come home. Um, so I, I know that we want to, to use Sean's time carefully, but I have found that when issues have, when I've heard the issues at a committee and then I've heard it in the town council, that I just have a much better understanding of it than if I hear it just once in one big super meeting, so. Just to be clear, this is not gonna be a one-time shot, even if it's a committee of the whole to begin with. Okay, great. This is, this is huge. So, I think that where we're at is that um, if we can come back to this, if somebody thinks of something else that they would like to bring back to it. Um, but I want to just talk a moment about meeting schedule and what I had sent out to you earlier today and the follow-up conversation that I had with uh, Mandy Haneke, who's the chair of CRC and uh, explain what the problem is. Um, Dorothy um, is going to be joining CRC and um, the changeover in committee assignments happens on February 1st. So that after today's meeting, um, we need to make sure that CRC meetings do not um, happen at the same time as finance committee meetings since Dorothy's assigned to both committees. And uh, so that is uh, why Mandy and I have been having some conversations. And she had originally proposed, um, I think it was second and fourth uh, Tuesdays for the meetings and um, that which got me into thinking about first and third. And I think that part of the problem that we had was is that our plan had been, has been since the beginning built around uh, the day after um, council meetings. But when you look at the council meeting schedule for FY21, it, there are times when there are three meetings a month and there are times when there's one meeting a month and a lot of it is built around Monday holidays and uh, so that uh, both Mandy and I were going a little bit crazy trying to figure out how that would work when we talked about it so that um, we, that's why they were um, thinking about going to every other week and it suggested that they'd be the second and fourth and that we'd be the first and third. Um, but then she ran into another problem that she needs to talk with her committee about after February 1st. And that is that um, the um, need to have some meetings of CRC that coincide with uh, either planning board or planning board zoning subcommittee meetings, which is an internal issue of their committee but she said that she didn't want to talk about that at a committee meeting until after February 1st when new members um, were appointed. And um, they, uh, so that, uh, and of course, they, all committees have to elect new chairs again after February 1st. Um, and uh, so that she's not even certain that, that she'll be chair, so, and nor am I. For that matter, uh, but that's that was what the uh, what one problem was. The other problem that Mandy and I were talking about that we are going to have to figure out is uh, that uh, during the month of May, we always have the additional burden of a, of more meetings than we otherwise have planned for because that is the time we have received the 
referral of the town manager budget and have 30 days according to the charter um, to uh, review the budget and make a recommendation to the council. And um, we had been doing twice a week meetings during the month of May. And uh, so that uh, we also have to uh, factor that into meeting schedule. So my suggestion is that we establish a February meeting schedule for now and that we just go ahead and do it based on first and third um, Tuesdays. And uh, that uh, when we have a better idea of CRC's um, final schedule so that we know that we're not doing anything that's in conflict with that, that we we establish a schedule for the rest of the time. And that what I would uh, like to start doing is take the document we were working on previously and um, initially work with Kathy as vice chair, yeah, but then very quickly turn it back to the entire committee and see if we can um, attach some dates to that schedule. So that's my recommendation. I don't uh, now want to open it up to the committee to um, react to the recommendation. Any thoughts, Pat? Excuse me. Um, I can, I have the first and third <coughs> Tuesdays in February. I cannot be there. On, would that start on the, the first? <coughs> or the first meeting would be on the second. And I, I cannot be here for that meeting. <coughs> um, if it's at two, two to four, I cannot be at it. And that's unusual. That's not a regular conflict, but it is for next week. <coughs> yeah, we can uh, move off of uh, Tuesdays if um, people have an, an alternative date that they want to suggest that is not conflicting with other things for, because we're talking about just the month of February. I'm only trying to right now to do February and then we'll come back to a longer type of thing. Um, if we do a, if we do February 2nd, then it's only a week away. Um, we could try Thursdays, which is the other date that we sometimes add in when we're doing the um, budget review. Uh, we have often gone to Thursday afternoons from two to four or 2.30 to five, 4.30. Of course, it's a myth that we end at four, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, that does not work for me at all. Yeah, the, the fourth will not work for me. Uh, and the, what about Monday the eighth? Oh no, we have a we have a council meeting then. Council I'm sorry, I apologize. It's oh. always hard to do a council meeting day. The fifteenth and the first uh, is is Wednesday um, out. Depends on the time. It, yeah. It, it GOL is in the morning, which is going to knock out Pat. And then I have pretty much from one to three on Wednesdays tied up. So I could do, you know, three to five or whatever. Mm -hmm. And just th there's one meeting that's not scheduled yet because we were waiting for who was going to be on JCPC for the council. And you're looking at uh, two people that are going to be on that. And we were meeting at 5, 530 on Wednesdays last spring we just don't we don't have a time slot yet so wednesday would be okay as long as it doesn't run into that that and it might still be fine it's because it's not scheduled for anything yet what about friday the um, fifth and then friday the 19th just in february fine with me 
looks to me. Any objection? Yeah. You usually don't like Friday meetings, but in the afternoon, but uh, you know, the stay of Zoom when we're not traveling, it's not as big a problem. <laughs> Which, which days did you just say? The 5th and the 19th? Just for the one month. We would not, Friday would not become our regular date. And we're talking about at what time? I'm open both of those days until 5. So any time that works for the larger group. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can't do it in the morning. I, I'm, I could do it any time after 12 o'clock. You just stay with two o'clock. Yes, two o'clock. Two o'clock on the fifth and on the nineteenth. Yeah. And I then we're, then we're deleting the twenty third and the ninth, which I have puzzled in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Jane, does that work for you? So unless I hear somebody saying they can't do it, uh, we're talking about two o'clock on the 5th and the 19th. Okay. And uh, that's not our regular schedule. This is February only, and we will establish as soon as we can in February uh, a schedule for the rest of the year. Thank you. We, we, we might be going back to the first and third Tuesdays. Sean? Um, just because the fifth is coming up pretty soon, do we have a sense of what the agenda would be for that meeting? I think the question, Sean, is going to be whether or not we're ready with the financial model. Okay. okay. Yep. We also have the audit and the OPEB report done. So it's possible we could we could do those as well, um, but we can connect about that offline. Yeah, that would be an awful lot to do all of those things, but- um, Yeah, probably one or the other. Okay, so I'll work with, uh, work with Lynn and I'll consult Kathy about the, the um, agenda, but- just so sure you would be ready if if we said we wanted to see the new and improved or modified model. Are you would you be ready then, or is that premature? Just on our choices. Um, I think there's some things that we wanted to do related to um, around community engagement and outreach um, when we present this that we wanted to have ready to go for when we present it. That it would be a little too soon. I think for next week we wanted to have some. You know some ways to get feedback and, and input from people. Um, so I think the following meeting would be better if that's possible to shoot for the night. I think it was the nineteenth, um, because that's close to what we were originally anticipating um, under the old finance committee schedule. So um, if that's, I mean, we could go for the fifth, but I think preferable would be the nineteenth. Can somebody check to see if uh, our our audit firm is Melanson Heath? Right. Uh, See if Melance and Heath is, uh, would be prepared to. Yeah, to Sonia and I will reach out to um, we'll reach out to Melanson and see if um, if they can be available for for Friday. Can I just ask a favor that people hold on to Tuesday afternoon so that we don't give that up and start scheduling into it? I, I personally do not enjoy giving up. Friday is my one day I try to keep. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I infinitely am, uh, I, I infinitely like Tuesday better. Is it possible, having, having said that, um, looking at our, going back and looking at the February schedule, if we did First and third, they would be the 16th. Could we still stay with the 16th? That was, that was the one who had a problem with the, the third. Does the 16th work? Uh, the 16th, I'm fine in February. So maybe we, what we should do is just make that one shift for one week only and do mm -hmm. it on the 5th and uh, see Thank if Heath is available. That'd be great. 
and uh, because then we could, do, we could meet as an audit committee for that day is our principal agenda item. So we would go back then to the 16th. Yeah. Yep. But on the 5th is when we would do the audit. Right. The 16th is when we hope to bring in the financial model. Yep. Oh, okay. And the last question back to Sean is um, on the OPEB. Um, at what point do you think we're really going to be ready to meet with the um, on the, the 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 person who this year did the uh, assessment? And yeah, so so the report's done. It, it's more it's a matter of just scheduling it. Um, it depends how you want to spread out the dryness. Uh, so <laughs> If you wanted to, if you wanted to spread it out, you know, audit and OPEB are kind of similar in terms of, um, you know, the the, the content. Um, it's going to be a Friday afternoon. Just bore us to death. I think, I think it's good. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes. So, but I can reach out. We'll reach out to the actuary too and see what days work for her, and, I, and I'll get that back to you so you can schedule it or whenever you think makes sense. So, so we have a different actuary this year from yeah so we have a our, our previous actuary retired um so we went back out to bid for a new actuary for this year and, and we found somebody who's really um does a really great job and has worked with our audit firm before and came highly recommended so uh, sean was that somebody from western mass or did, did we still have to go eastern mass um i don't know where she's out of i'll have to look i'm not sure um where her firm is located yeah, the OPEB is a uh, significant issue in both comes from both the audit and in the other report. Yeah, they're kind of related in some ways. So. Yeah. So we just approved the we I just approved the audit today, so we don't have the final audit in our hands yet. So hopefully we'll have it soon. Oh, interesting. Well, we don't anticipate any changes at this point. We've sort of signed off on the except for a couple little minor footnote changes. We've, we've kind of signed off on it, but we'll make sure we have a final copy before we, um, before we present it. I think we now have the dates set for the uh, meetings in February. We, um, at the second February meeting, we will establish a schedule for the rest of the year. Uh, we will meet with Melanson if, um they will be ready and they have to let us know that and whether they're both ready and available uh, and uh, if not you know we'll make adjustments so i think that's it anything else no nope. none i then i'll uh declare the meeting adjourned and i want to thank emily oh. for uh being here and taking notes for us and mm -hmm. thank uh Sean and Sonia and uh, the entire committee. And Thank you. Let yeah. me just say, if you would like to reach out to Andy to find out, have questions about anything that went on today, given that you, this is new to you, please do that. And the rest of us are willing to help with that as well. Mm -hmm. And your son is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. would note that we're keeping yeah, it. Fine we're talk sometime this week, we should. I didn't hear. I didn't hear you, Andy. I was saying to Jazz, really speaking to Jane. Maybe I'll email you separately and see if you want to if you want to schedule a time to talk. Okay. So with that, I declare the meeting adjourned. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.